Good morning, all. It's a real pleasure to bring you back for the second day of conversations. We had a really good um, set of uh, talks and responses yesterday, and I'm sure we're going to continue in a similar vein today. I have the particular pleasure of introducing two speakers whose work I've known for the longest time, but who I hadn't, hadn't met, um, neither of them, till yesterday. Um, uh, Melinda Rabb is professor of English at Brown University, where she's currently chair of the faculty. Uh, she confessed that when she went to her hotel room last night, she had 500 emails, and I was wondering about that, and I saw 50, 500, it's all the same. But now I see that she's chair of the faculty, and I know exactly why she had that many emails. She's the author of Satire and Secrecy in English Literature, from Paul Grave in 2007, and Miniature and, and the English Imagination, Literature, Cognition, and Small-Scale Culture, and this from Cambridge University Press this year, as well as numerous chapters and articles on satire, women's writing, fiction, war, and on a variety of authors, including, of course, Swift. She's been the recipient of several grants and fellowships, uh, awards from the NEH, the Lilly Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the American Society for 18th uh, Century Studies, and the Winterthur Museum in our backyard, or so we like to believe. Her current book project, Parting Shots, focuses on displacements of 17th century civil war trauma in 18th century literature. I'm going to introduce Catherine too, uh, so that they can speak after each other without interruption. Catherine Ingracia is professor of English at Virginia Commonwealth University. Her publications include authorship, commerce, and gender in early 18th century England, more solid learning, new perspectives, that was in 1998, more solid learning, New Perspectives on Pope's Dunciad, which he co-edited from Bucknell in 2000. Companion to the 18th Century Novel and Culture, another co-edited volume in 2005. She has been, as several of you will know, remember from the masthead, a past editor of Studies in 18th Century Culture. And she has edited Eliza Haywood's Auntie Pamela in, for Broadway, Broadview in 2004, as well as a co-edited British Women Poets of the Long 18th Century for Hopkins in 2009. Most recently, there's a lot of editorial work here, as you can see, she edited The Cambridge Companion to Women's Writing in Britain. She's published a number of essays on the literature and culture of 18th century England, and with a particular focus on the women writers of Swift's circle. Her book, her current project, is called um, Cultures of Captivity, 1660 to 1760. I neglected to mention, but I'm glad to um, do so now, this panel is called Secret Swift. So there's much to be discovered. Thank you. Good. Okay, let's see. Sorry. Good morning, all, and thank you very much for both the conference and the kind introduction. Swift belongs to the 21st century, yet he was a backward, not a forward-looking man. His works constantly are glancing at what Howard Weinbrot calls his rearview mirror. He extensively read, vigorously annotated, and authored books of history um, as his library, Marginalia, Conduct of the Allies, Four Last Years of the Queen, and other works attest. He sought the job of royal historiographer. Subtler biographical details also are telling a man who names his garden Naboth's Vineyard sees the world through a story of a broken covenant with the past. Since the biblical Naboth refuses to sell his land to King Ahab, not because it was an investment in the future, some ripening grapes perhaps, but because it held meaning as a paternal inheritance. Naboth's enemies, Swift wrote in his poem, The Garden, successfully hatched a plot disparaging his religious and political beliefs before stoning him to death. God then cursed the land forevermore. Swift, sardonically identifying, alludes to the blight cast by the past on the future when he refers to the property's cursed wall and to, quote, weather that continues as foul as if there had not been a day of rain in the summer. It will have some very ill effect on the kingdom. What exactly was Switch Swift watching in that rearview mirror? And did it have a blind spot? 
Today I focus on Swift's lifelong preoccupations with secrecy and with the trauma of the English Civil Wars as a way of understanding his relationship to history in general and to secret history in particular. The wars were a catastrophe of stunning magnitude, luridly documented in print, bringing to mind Maurice Blanchot's comment that a great disaster is, quote, that in thought itself which dissuades us from thinking of it, that pushes us to the limit of writing. And haunts narratives of restoration and continuity with the specter of failed coherence, of a world shattered and turned upside down. We, living in a time of global civil war, may be particularly well situated to consider the inevitable limits of thought and representation then and now. As historiographers, Swift and his contemporaries lived between, quote, a dismal tragedy so fresh in our memories, as Mary Astle put it in 1704, and acts from Parliament and King, quote, that the differences may be buried in perpetual oblivion. <clears throat> Within this chronological space of recalling and forgetting, openness and concealment, English historiography is renovated and secret history is born. How bad were the late differences? Britain lost 2% of its population in World War I. The 1640s conflict destroyed over 4% of the population in England and Wales and far more in Ireland and Scotland. Death by battle, disease, siege, starvation, destruction of property, maiming, imprisonment, enslavement, and homelessness accompanied the radical undoing of fundamental premises of sovereignty and of political and religious order. The 1641 rebellion in and subsequent crushing of Ireland challenged the very definition of bare life when, quote, all the public roads were strode with the dead carcasses of miserable wretches whose mouths were green with their last meal of grass. Civil War description, descriptions resonate with Giorgio Agamben's provocative metaphor of bare life, referring to the woundable, expendable body, not as in Hobbes's state of nature, simply natural reproductive life, the Zoe of Aristotle, nor fully bios, a good life within a meaningful political order. Bare life is damaged life, bereft of political significance, and abandoned to unlimited exposure to violation that does not count as a crime. Scholars, including David Oakleaf, S.J. Connolly, and Christopher Fox, agree that Swift's, quote, lifelong interest in the Civil Wars can legitimately be called an obsession. And they have documented the very personal ways in which the wars affected his family fortunes by plunder, physical terror, dislocation. Fox recounts the final raid on a December morning with Swift's grandparents already in hiding. The family's 10 children, including Jonathan's father, were left with no food or clothing, and the neighbors warned not to feed them. Quote, everything was taken by the parliamentary soldiers, including a dish of breast milk for the baby. Four sons were forced to move to Ireland, including Swift's father, driven thither by their sufferings. His birth in Ireland is a direct consequence of the civil wars. And yet Swift, aware that the quagmire of the partisan present and the perils of the future were a direct consequence of this most important disaster, never sustained an explicit history of the wars. He read about them and referred to them repeatedly. He reread Clarendon's History of the Rebellion, although he objected to the prefatory remark Quote, we live now, God be thanked, in a time when we need not fear encroachment on our just liberties. Next to it, Swift wrote, a silly, tedious irony and a very foolish preface. Why did he not respond at length? In the preface to his History of the World, 
Sir Walter Raleigh warns of the liabilities that accompany efforts to record the most crucial events of the recent past. Quote, whosoever in writing a modern history shall follow truth too near the heels, it may happily strike out his teeth. Raleigh's metaphor conjures up the backward kick of a horse, the eager historian venturing too close to the horse's behind and knocked back by a blow to the head, provides a cautionary paradigm of one mode of historiography. To Raleigh's 17th century caution about approaching a skittish past, I want to add some modern and postmodern theories about the dilemma of looking backward at culture-altering calamities that will frame the topic of swift and secret history. While I plan to sketch the fascinating intersection of Swift's work with the practices of this curious historiographical mode, I also hope to show that secret history matters not only as a means of disclosure, as recent critics like Rebecca Bullard have maintained, but also as a means of evasion, deflection, and displacement as a way of ducking the horse's hooves. Walter Benjamin, contemplating the horrors of the 1930s, turns in his thesis on the philosophy of history to the difficulties of recording the truth about an imminent past. The angel of history, as Benjamin interprets Paul Clay's painting, Angelus Novus, I'm paraphrasing him, looks as though he were about to distance himself from something that he fixedly contemplates, eyes widely staring, mouth open, wings outstretched, the angel's face is turned toward the past where he perceives not a chain of events, but one catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel wants to reach out and redeem this wreckage, but a storm blows with such force that he cannot close his wings. He is propelled irresistibly into the future to which his back is turned, while the rubble heap before him grows higher. Past traumas, according to Benjamin's paradigm, contradict belief in history as a narrative of advancing civilization. A deep irony accompanies the notion that, quote, we are pulled forward by future happiness when in fact we are blown backward by the destruction we keep perpetuating on the way. Closer to our own time is Judith Butler's questioning of the presumption that the failure that the future follows and redeems the past. In the struggle over which lives matter, over the history of, quote, deliberate acts of violence against a collectivity that acts, acts that constitute an assault on thinking, she frames the future as a fractured horizon, wherein the losses of the past are always carried forward, a persistent, always already impaired futurity that mitigates against the notion that chances and conditions get better. Quote, somewhere, somehow, something was lost, but no story can be told about it. No memory can return it. A fractured horizon looms in which to make one's way, one for whom full recovery is impossible, one for whom the irrecoverable becomes paradoxically the condition of a new political agency. Swift, I believe, works within this paradox of the immediacy yet inaccessibility of past events. He assumes that representations of political crises do not necessarily inhere in established literary forms. The coincidence of Swift's writing career with the rise of experimental discourses of secret history strike me as more than, well, more than coincidence both take off in the 1690s and flourish in the first three decades of the 18th century. Growing critical attention to secret history over the past 25 years has identified key characteristics congenial to Swift, such as transverse reading practices that ask us, as Bullard notes, to read and think across boundaries between polemic, news, romance, scandal, manuscript fragments, letters, and travelogue. They appeal to broad audiences, experiment with narrative perspectives, often privilege marginal voices, not very high-minded, 
they nevertheless are self-conscious about the ramifications of secrecy, ethically and politically. Sex and power are inseparable. Explanatory keys can make readers com complicit in the pursuit of truth. Arbitrary power is a central theme, often realized through a high-low fantasy that leads from public spaces like the court into private ones like the boudoir, closet, and bath. As anecdota, or formerly unpublished stories, they always exist in relation to and revise a prior version of something. They set in motion contradictory possibilities and assume a conspiratorial culture governed by pretense and clandestine motive. Irreverent, contentious, and destabilizing, secret history's assumptions about the nature of representation overlap with theories of parody and irony. It was, Catherine Gallagher writes, the very fact of secret history's marginal status on the hierarchy of genres that enabled so many secret historians to initiate major changes in the way English writers represented their nation's past. Although secret history has a fascinating trajectory reaching into the later 18th century and beyond, I concentrate today on its early stages when it developed within the partisan post-Civil War struggles of the late 17th and early 18th century. Swift had significant exposure and access to secret histories. Beginning with Procopius's Anecdota, or the secret history of the reign of the Emperor Justinian, it was the ur text of royal scandal that hit the bestseller list in England in 1674. Here are some relevant titles. And among many vestiges of authors and anonymous texts not documentable in libraries where Swift can be shown to have read, and as identified by Passman and Deacon, are yet more practitioners like Defoe, Oldmixon, and Phillips. Evidence of secret history is not hard to find within his work. Consider his early ode to the Athenian society. The younger Swift was taken with the idea that a secret council of experts would answer all submitted questions, no matter how private or personal. Eventually, he realized that these experts would remain shrouded in obscurity because they didn't exist. <clears throat> but the society's perpetrator, John Dunton, would go on to become a prolific author of secret histories. Swift's ode responds to the concept of concealment by referring to a story of sex and politics that exactly suits the salacious scenes, <clears throat> invisibilities, <clears throat> spies and bourgeois explanations of power in secret histories. Condolis, king of Lydia, foolishly brags about the beauty of his wife to the minister Gyges, allowing him to hide where he can observe the naked queen. Gyges possesses a ring of invisibility, which he uses to seduce the wife, murder Condolis, and usurp the throne. In Plato's Republic, the story triggers a debate about whether people who are assured of secrecy would be moral in their actions or would indulge in a terrifying ambition and self-aggrandizement. Uh, Swift's poem poses this troubling question, quote, else why should the famed Lydian king, with all the charms of usurped wife and throne, with all that power, still new unexperienced glories wait and still wear, still dote on the invisible ring. One wonders if the impudent tone of Swift's marginalia, their pugilistic dialogue with the histories they challenge and revise, would be quite the same without his awareness of secret history's brash conflation of sex and power, and power as arbitrary. On the pages of Davila's histories of the civil wars of France, Swift rewrites Mary Queen of Scots as a most infamous lewd cursed jade the Prince of Condé as a perfidious rascal, the Duke of Guise as a jaded lover who had lain with her. Kings are false perjured rogues whose amiable qualities are an abominable heap of lies. And the Sir de Villars is rewarded for public vi vi valor, but, quote, all this favor is because he married the author's sister. A king takes physic for euf a euphemistically phrased private indisposition, bluntly identified in the margins as the pox. Impatiently, Swift looks for the secret springs, quote, surely the author conceals the most important causes of this new general insurrection. In the margins of Mackey's secret services, respected public figures are disclosed as 
detestably covetous, a great booby, very prostitute, as arrant a scoundrel as his brother, partaking in very infamous pleasures. Sordid lineage is exposed. His father was a noted rogue. His father was a groom. And dignity is stripped away. A profligate rogue without religion or morals, but cunning enough, yet without abilities of any kind. Swift asserts the secret historian's claim to insider knowledge, like the invisible spy or silent spectator who witnesses firsthand the peccadilloes of unsuspecting ministers and nobles, Swift comments in the first person, as great a dunce as ever I knew, as much a puppy as ever I saw. His true character would take up too much time for me, who knew him well, to describe it. The conduct, conduct of the allies reveals, quote, conspiracy founded upon interest and ambition, intrigue of a faction among us whose interests lay in perpetuating the war, and scandal tinged with the erotic. Rapacious ministers, quote, pursued the queen through all her retreats, attacked and stormed the castle, forcing her to fly to an adjoining cottage. An advertisement for the four last years of the queen references Procopius-like circumstances. Procopius's manuscript lay unpublished for a thousand years, we're told. A single suppressed copy by slim chance has, quote, been rescued from obscurity, perhaps from destruction. But a friend of perfect intimacy with the aging author decided to let this copy, which he had now kept many years most secretly, see the light. The text, readers are promised, will discover that, quote, Swift knew the most secret springs of every movement in the whole complicated machine, although it was not intended to be published in the author's lifetime. Like typical plots of arbitrary power achieved through manip manipulative desire, Marlborough's fate is determined by a woman. It is to the Duchess the Duke is chiefly indebted for his greatness and fall. Swift pulls the veils away from her, quote, court reputation for love and gallantry to reveal three furies hidden in her breast, sordid average, avarice, disdainful pride, and ungovernable rage. Godolphin professes a sort of passion for the queen. His letters to her were in a style of what the French called double entendre, in a mixture of love and respect. <clears throat> he used frequently to send her little presents of those things that are agreeable to ladies. His predominant passions were love and play, which could be used either in an intrigue of gallantry or politics. Swift collaborated on the examiner papers with the period's most famous secret historian, Della Riviere Manley, and he parodied the New Atlantis in Gulliver's Travels. Keys, the, oh, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> Keys, the apparatus of secrecy, were published in conjunction with The Tale of a Tub and The Travels. Contending irreverent versions of history are crucial elements of his satire. Of Christianity in a tale, ancient writers in the battle, famous people in glub dub drib, and of course England in the contradictory revelations in Brobdingnag and Winnemland. But since I and others have elaborated on these instances elsewhere, I want to use my remaining moments to pursue the idea of secret history as displacement rather than disclosure. Secret histories of the 1690s, with very rare exception, pick up England's story at the restoration and succession crisis and avoid the civil wars. I am aware of only one secret history that, include Charles, that includes Charles I's reign. In this perfunctory account, the Irish rebellion gets one sentence, the civil wars two pages, and the regicide brief euphemistic circumspection at the very end. Quote, the parliament, with most of the officers of the army, brought the king to trial by a judic judicature of their own setting up, which proved his ruin, finis. In contrast, most early secret histories are expansively Whig and Williamite, and lavish details exposing Charles II and James II, their mistresses, sexual transgressions, conspiracies, greed, and desires for arbitrary power, and soon Tory writers turn the tables and adapt secret history to their own causes. It would be possible to situate Swift within these partisan narratives. The most recent book on Swift and history is entirely committed 
to ascertaining at each step of his career whether he was shifting more toward Whig or Tory sentiments, championing, championing liter liberty or upholding authoritarianism. And many fine swift scholars had engaged in similar debates. However, I confess that after thinking about Swift, secret history, and civil war, I find myself caring less and less about pinpointing exactly when and where he was inclining more toward a certain shade of Whig or Tory. But then I also don't care whether he married Stella or had sex with Vanessa. <laughs> I don't think worrying about these matters helps us read Swift in the 21st century. In closing, then, let me return to the idea that Swift appreciated and, and participated in secret history as a strategy of distraction, that the disaster of civil war that, that obsessed him lurks just behind the exposure of less egregious, less unspeakable concealments. My specific example will be the war's atrocity of granting no quarter to soldiers, civilians, and the Irish. Here is an example of what I mean. In the fourth voyage, Gulliver's encounter with the libidinous female Yahoo draws on conventional and recurrent scenes from secret histories and even echoes a specific passage in Manley's New Atlantis. You'll recognize these if you've read any of these secret histories. The weather is hot, clothes come off, water beckons, and just as the unsuspecting naked bather ventures in, out of the bushes or from within the closet or behind the arras, leaps an amorous aggressor, inflamed by desire, those are Swift's words, to attempt seduction or rape. No matter how stylized, frequent, or predictable, these spicy scenes do get readers' attention, no less in the 21st than in the 18th century. They're gratifying, titillating, pleasing. These distracting episodes, this distracting episode, in which the embarrassing secret of Gulliver's Yahoo-ness is fully revealed, it really isn't that much of a secret at that point, is followed by a chapter blandly titled, a grand debate uh, among the General Assembly of the Whinnoms. Well, I won't read it. You can see it here. This chapter, in fact, contains a double extermination fantasy. What Butler calls, quote, deliberate acts of violence against a collectivity, acts that constitute an assault on thinking, indirectly linked to the civil conflict about which Swift knew and cared so much. The earlier chapter's encounter on the riverbank focused on the naked body as subject of sexual desire, as in secret histories. This chapter focuses on the naked body as the object of mass slaughter, as in accounts of the civil wars. Quote, it was common throughout the war, writes historian Michael Braddock, for the dead to be stripped so that in the morning the field was covered with naked corpses. Of Marston Moore, soldier Simeon Ash recalls, quote, in the morning there was a mortifying object to behold when the naked bodies of thousands lay upon the ground not altogether dead. Although Swift does not lead Gulliver, the only clothed human in a land of naked creatures, directly to the edge of a pit or into a field where heaps of bare corpses lie, we know that somewhere in Whinnom land, such mass graves must exist after the Whinnoms conducted a, quote, general hunting of the yahoos. Gulliver just mentions it in passing, but perhaps Swift had read the parliamentary record from 1646 describing an ambush during the Civil Wars, quote, we had a gallant hunting of them from place to place over the hills. Like Cromwell's troops granting no quarter to whole populations, but sparing a few individuals for slavery in the Barbados, Whinnoms, quote, enclosed the whole herd, except every Whinnom kept two young ones, using them for draft and carriage. A passage from the first edition of Gulliver's Travels, which would be omitted after 1735, adds a detail to the travesty Genesis story about the origins of the Yahoos. 
The omitted passage suggests that, Swift's, that Swift may have been thinking of civil conflict because Gulliver notices that the faces of these hateful creatures look like countrymen back home. Quote, the original pair may have been English, which I was apt to suspect from the liniments of their posterity's countenances. It is hard to look at enemies directly in the face, especially as if, as in civil war, they look just like you and your neighbors. Swift seems to have understood that we can distract and even amuse ourselves by sharing salacious, scandalous, outrageous secrets that displace our anxiety and divert our attention away from historic trauma and irreparable loss that, as Blanchot says, press against the limits of writing. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to add my thanks to the chorus, uh, to Lynn and John, for such a wonderful gathering. Writing to an ailing Alexander Pope on April 20th, 1731, Jonathan Swift offers him detailed advice for alleviating his pain. Swift understood well the confinement and discomfort Pope was experiencing. By the early 1730s, Swift's mobility had been increasingly circumscribed by Meniere's disease, the lingering effects of a torn Achilles tendon producing this cruel accident of lameness, and the inevitable infirmities of age. He laments that he cannot yet venture to take those journeys that I used to take nothing of, and admits that he is daily harder to please. Sharing his palliative strategies, Swift encourages Pope to get as much summer air as possible, to drink ass's milk, or if you could bring your stomach to woman's milk, it would be far better than ass's, and to sweeten your milk with mirth and motion by descending to some other amusements as common mortals do. Chief among the other amusements Swift recommends is spending time with middling folks, whom one may govern as one pleases and who will think it an honor and happiness to attend to us, to talk or be silent, to laugh or look grave, just as they are directed. Swift explicitly advises associating with what he describes as talking females, who will go on or stop at your command. <laughs> During this particular period of his life, among the talking females with whom Swift most regularly interacted were the women who were part of a lively Dublin poetic coterie. Swift dubbed them his female triumphant, Mary Barber, Mary Sycan, and Constantia Grierson. It is to be understood, writes Swift, that the only women of taste here are shopkeepers' wives. Mary Pendarvis, who would become Mary Delaney, was subsequently an acquaintance among the wits, a group that also included Letitia Pilkington. These women, characterized in uh, Swift's original seraglio by Lord Ory, played an important role for him during a period of diminished spirits. The women operated in a poetic community that preceded and in many ways actually decentered Swift's role. They had been meeting since 1725 with the encouragement of Patrick Delaney. An unpublished tribute poem of Grierson's found in the manuscript book here at the Kislak, which is also on display in the exhibition, describes the women's poetry as work designed to free you from the oppression of mankind. And that last word, mankind, within the context of the verse, retains its gender-specific meaning. At the same time, the value of Swift's name and literary reputation made him important for the two more productive and now most well-known women within the group, Mary Barber and Letitia Pilkington. In the very differently realized pursuit of literary fame and compensation, Barbara and Pilkington strategically capitalized on their connection with Swift, brought him along on their imaginative travels, if you will, to increase the marketability of their respective publications and potentially improve the quality of their verse. They recognized that the price for this relationship was assuming an apparently subordinate submissive posture. Swift, in turn, used his relationships with Barber and Pilkington to exercise a very specific kind of control, both when the women were in his presence, that ability to command them to go on or stop talking, 
and when they served as surrogate, protege, messenger, or pupil. Swiss control took many manifestations. For Barber, it involved the activities necessary to help secure 918 subscribers and to eventually publish the volume of her poems. For Pilkington, it included more intimate and immediate forms of control, often within his domestic space. Taken individually, these moments reveal complex motivations, an amalgam of boredom, generosity, desire, frustration. Considered cumulatively, these efforts at control suggest how, at a time when Pope felt, excuse me, when Swift felt his, quote, poetic fountain was dry, he used these relationships and the intendant published and personal affirmation they produced to compensate for other kinds of losses and limitations, real and perceived. Mary Barber, introduced to Swift by Patrick Delaney, or possibly Grierson, was, in his words, a woolen draper's wife declined in the world with a knack at versifying. Delaney describes her as one who hath labored more years than Stephen Duck hath lived in a course of upright, obliging, well-guided, and unwearied, though unsuccessful, industry. There's a lot of uns in that uh, description. Mm -hmm. On the verge of 50, with a hereditary gout, cough, and asthma, with a load of four children and the preoccupation with her physical, her physicality is, I think, telling, Barber, Swift's citizen housewife poet, though excellently educated and perfectly well disposed, remained utterly unprovided for. Her depressed financial state, coupled with what Swift describes as her modesty and bashfulness, the latter her only defect, according to Swift, position her as an appropriate object for literary charity. To help Barber secure enough subscribers to enable her to publish her collection of poems, uh, which is also in display, or was on, in the pop-up, uh, Swift carefully mined his social and literary network, although she also assiduously worked on her own behalf as well, although that sort of diminished in his representation of it. Barber was one of the first women to publish a volume of poems by subscription, a publication strategy marking the transformation of the traditional patron-client relationship into a wider network of support in what might be considered sort of a curated marketplace. To subscribe to a volume did not necessarily mean the purchaser would actually read the verse, of course. Uh, it rather was an opportunity to appear generous, repay a favor to a friend, associate with a desirable group, see your name in print, or increase one's own social capital, all impulses Swift used to help Barber. In his correspondence, Swift prepares his London colleagues for Barber. On October 1730, he alerts Bathurst that there's an Irish poetess now in London soliciting the Duke of Dorset for an employment, though she be but a woolen draper's wife. He also preps Barber, guiding her movements in London with directed instructions about her solicitations. While he would doubtless offer similar instructions to advance a male favorite, his letter has a particularly directive tone. Writing to Barber in February 23rd, 1731, he lists a catalog of potential subscribers or collectors from whom he believes his name would do. Quote, if the people already named and any others who know me be told that it is by my request and earnest recommendation, I should fancy they would not refuse. He singles out Lady Catherine Hyde, instructing Barber to go get someone to let her know I command her to be a third subscriber, and her niece Charlotte, who refused to read to me, her assistant. If they will not submit by these tokens, I shall send circular letters and force them to obedience. His language, obedience, command, force, suggests his certainty about the leverage he still retains with a distant but still vital network. Swift's recent biographer Eugene Hammond describes this effort as a kind of reunion tour for Swift, who he posits found it gratifying to see how many of his 1710 to 14 friends and acquaintances remembered him fondly. Swift also appeals directly to intimates Gay and Pope and promises Barber to show you and all my friends that I am in earnest, I will, contrary to my general custom, subscribe my name by assuring you of my great esteem for your virtue, piety, and genius above your sex. Because Swift invested so much in Barber, positioned as his surrogate in these London interactions, any perceived missteps threatening to erode that control elicit a strong reaction. Unprompted by Swift, Barber contacts Pope directly to seek his assistance in revising her poems, resulting in Swift's apologetic admission to Pope that Mrs. Barber acted weakly in desiring you to correct her verses. She also allegedly forges two letters purporting to be written by Swift, enthusiastically supporting her subscription to Queen Caroline, which invoke his anger and causes him to describe her as almost a stranger 
And he goes to great distances after this to distance himself from uh, Barber. These actions, like her aggressive pursuit of subscribers in Tunbridge Wells, or the description of Barber by Charlotte Clayton as a strange, bold, disagreeable woman, might complicate the unalloyed characterization of Barber as modest and humble. Was the bashfulness Swift describes as her only defect, a strategically deployed pose to advance her literary career, the result of his persistent control, a perception engendered by her physical state, a willful misunderstanding, or some combination of them all. When Barbara's volume, Poems on Several Occasion, appears, it begins with Swift's letter to Ori that he gave Barbara the liberty to publish. The letter provides the collection and the poet with the important endorsement of the celebrated Swift, a gesture characterized as a favor. Yet placed first in the volume, the letter preempts Barbara's own dedication. Paraphrasing her letter to him, asking his opinion about dedicating her poems to your lordship, Swift makes public his somewhat scolding response in which he advises her to instead be silent. Chiding her for having been so unfashionable as to publish wherever she goes the surprising instances of Ori's generosity and favor that she hath already received, he laments that any further praise she offers him will be interpreted as the mere effect of flattery under the style and title of gratitude, setting her among the common herd of dedicators, a devalued location diminishing her and by association Swift. Thus Swift, upon the most mature deliberation, concludes that the, the dedication will not come properly from her pen, rather he himself will guess the topics she intends to insist on, listing the qualities worthy of praise he imagines Mrs. Barber designs to insist on in the dedication of her poems to your lordship. Certainly one can hear satiric murmurs as Swift effectively dismantles the rhetorical manipulation of a dedication. You can almost hear him say, well, and she would have said yada, yada, yada. Yet publishing his own letter assumes the responsibility of the dedication, highlighting what, must, what might be considered Barbara's previous missteps. He rehearses all she owes her patron, or more accurately, patrons, plural, for Swift essentially constructs a place for himself as a shadow patron, something that Barbara's own dedication underscores. Swift's words limit her ability to praise Ori. She focuses instead on Swift, who she mentions six times, tellingly each moment of praise for Ori is filtered through an explicit reference to something she has been taught by Swift. And even visually, it's, it's Ori and Swift right there uh, in the dedication. Barbara's preface instead offers an intimate, her preface, which follows her dedication, offers an intimate portrait of the life and personal qualities of, I'm sorry, Swift. Uh, however, after the second dedication, Swift largely disappears from the volume. Barbara's press press, which follows this dedication, offers an intimate portrait of the life and personal qualities of the recently deceased Constantia Grierson, perhaps a way for Barbara to reclaim her volume and more appropriately locate its origins in the group of female poets so important to her. A savvy and often subversive poet focused on social justice, Barbara accepts the position of subordinate recipient of Swift's generosity. Her poems with their satiric eye, vibrant voices, and details of common life share to some degree po Swift's poetic sensibility. But aside from the dedication and his listing as a subscriber for 10 copies of the book, he is strikingly absent from the rest of her volume, perhaps her efforts to assert a measure of control. Where Barbara is deemed bashful, Letitia Pilkington is saucy and pretty pert by her own description. The daughter of a prominent Dublin physician, initially enjoying a genteel upbringing and elevated family connections, Pilkington eluded the conventional norms for women of her time. She remained, as she calls herself, an irregular verb, resistant to easy categorization. Introduced to Swift in 1729, a few years after her marriage to clergyman and aspiring poet Matthew, Pilkington's vivacity, persistence, and poetic skills quickly made her, in Mary Delaney's words, a bosom friend of Dean Swift's. Swift famously referred to Matthew and Letitia Pilkington as a little young poetical parson and his littler young poetic wife because of their physically diminutive uh, stature. <laughs> Matthew, in Matthew, Pilkington found a poetically ambitious and personally indifferent husband who resented her prodigious abilities. 
Matthew's infidelity, infidelity, professional intrigues, and personal animosity toward Pilkington, as well as their increasingly precarious financial situation, caused them to become estranged. Their public acrimonious divorce in 1738, spurred by Matthew's accusations of adultery, prompted Swift and much of Dublin society to repudiate Pilkington. Swift subsequently described her famously as the most profligate whore in either kingdom. After her divorce, beset by extreme poverty and encouraged by Kali Sibber to write it as you say it and it will sell, an interesting nod to the oral dimension of her work, Pilkington published the first volume of her memoirs in Dublin in early 1748. <coughs> Appearing only three years after Swift's, Swift's death, the first volume strategically capitalizes on the fame of his works, which are universally known and universally esteemed, as well as her own personal knowledge of Swift, with whom she passed whole days. Pilkington describes herself as having had unusual access by being a person sans consequence. Few persons now living have had so many opportunities of seeing him in private life. She promises to provide us with details about a secret Swift. Determined to set nothing down but what I had from his own mouth, Pilkington seeks to redress misunderstandings of Swift, lamenting it is the fate of all eminent persons to have various characters given to them, so it was more remarkably his. He was, she insists, a man of humanity, although often hid under a rough appearance. She affirms his preference in the latter part of his life to surround himself with people from a very narrow compass who he could be free with and could control. Describing his personal habits, Pilkington notes his odd horse-like gait, his habit of walking out within doors or traveling up and down stairs within the house to get sufficient exercise, kind of like someone trying to hit 10,000 steps on their Fitbit inside, uh, and the practical jokes he would play on her, her husband, and his servants. Those episodes reveal Swift's imaginative play, if in a confined way, but also act as another strategy for demonstrating his control. Many of the anecdotes Pilkington shares, and I'm not going to rehearse them all because they're, they're, most of them are very familiar to Swift scholars, uh, revolve around either Swift asserting his dominance over her through the performance of a menial task or a, equivocal statements about her capacity, or demonstrating the power he has over others. He also flouts social norms in their interactions. When he dines at what he calls her Lilliputian palace, uh, he uninvited inspects all the rooms, garret, bedchamber, library, and kitchen, complimenting her good housewifery for having the whole house clean rather than only those rooms where guests were to be entertained. And this idea of cleanliness and feminine space is obviously deeply relevant at this period. And if you notice, he comments, but uh, for no doubt, but a slut would have the, uh, the rooms clean essentially only where the guests were to be entertained. Certainly, Pilkington details the small kindnesses Swift visited upon her during their friendship, slipping her money equal to the amount she put in the collection plate at church that Sunday, praising her poetry, regularly inviting her to dine with him, and sending her a tender note and gift following the death of her infant son, to whom he had pledged to be godfather. His perspective travels with her throughout the memoirs. She reads the poor hygiene of her London landlady through the lens of the lady's dressing room, claiming, quote, until I saw this wretch, I imagined the dean had only mustered up all the dirty ideas in the world in one place on purpose to affront the fair sex. Most strikingly, however, to a contemporary reader, is Pilkington's detail about Swift's methods of control over her and the women around him. She wryly observes that when Swift found them docile, he took great pleasure to instruct them. Certainly Mary Barber seemed appropriately docile and grateful. The fundamentally asymmetrical power relationship that defines the patron-author connection, amplified by class, gender, and national identity, increased the kind of control Swift could exert over Barber. She readily fulfilled most requests he made of her, from subordinating her voice in the dedication to transporting to England dangerous manuscript copies of his politically subversive poems, an act for which she was arrested in 1734 after being betrayed by Matthew Pilkington. Swift's treatment of Barber forces us to explore the line between generosity and dominance, charity and control. Pilkington apparently experienced a much different dynamic, and I say apparently because we have limited information about Swift's personal interactions with Barber. 
especially because they're obscured when he attempts to distance himself from her. Uh, Pilkington observes that where great talents are bestowed, there the strongest passions are likewise given. Pilkington acknowledges this truly great man did but too often let his passions have dominion over him, and that, and that on the most trifling occasions. She tells of servants badgered and very rude behavior even with his superiors. She writes of narrowly making my escape from his wrath, or moments where he flew into a rage that quite terrified me. He tells of anger that exceeds the power of con his control. She complains that the dean, and after his example, Mr. Pilkington, were eternally satirizing and ridiculing the female sex, prompting her to write her poem, The Statues. The period of satire and ridicule that she to which she refers, of course, aligns with Swift's writing of poems like The Lady's Dressing Room and A Beautiful Young Nymph Going to Bed, complex poems that, as we discussed in the wrap-up yesterday, have moments of both passion and disgust, misogyny and sympathy. Most vividly, Pilkington records Swift's methods of correction or instruction for the talking females I mentioned at the start. Pilkington offers a detailed description, which is uh, on the screen. If I have any merit as a writer, I must gratefully acknowledge it is due to the pains he took to teach me, though to tell the truth, he was a very rough sort of tutor for one of my years and sex. For whenever I made an use of an inelegant phrase, I was sure of a deadly pinch and frequently received chastisement before I knew my crime. Reflecting on this form of instruction, Pilkington interprets it as a mark of her distinction, as something meant for merit. I'm convinced, continues Pilkington, had he thought me incorrigibly dull, I should have escaped without correction, and the black and blue favorites I received at his hands were meant for merit, though bestowed on me. It's perhaps telling that this passage from Pilkington is the final one in the extended excerpt from the memoirs that appear in the April 1748 Gentleman's Magazine, just two months before the memoirs were published in London. During the same period, Mary Pendarvey similarly writes of Swift's favors of pinching and beating used to correct her mistakes in grammar and pronunciation. Pilkington describes three other episodes where she either anticipates physical violence, I'm not sure Swift would not have beat me, but that fortunately for me, a gentleman came to visit, or experiences it, he beat me most immoderately. These statements are striking in light of Pilkington's explicit declaration that her husband Matthew, for whom she had little regard and certainly no love lost, did not beat me, says it very explicitly. Little has been made of these corroborated de descriptions, a kind of she said, he said. A common question about Pilkington and Swift scholarship is some version of how reliable is she, a question that has a strikingly contemporary resonance. Arch Alias, who certainly knew more about Letitia Pilkington than any other scholar, finds her, particularly in volume one, in which all but one of these examples appears, an excellent source. I have not yet encountered, writes Alias, a first-hand story made up, even at their most tenuous, there always seems to be some basis in fact. Any lingering discomfort with Pilkington's memoirs may be a residue of the disreputable associations that have traveled with her, even into the 21st century. Her lack of narrative control, she claims I'm too volatile to revise or correct anything I write, and openly financial motives can prompt an easy dismissal, although that very volatility and conversational digressive style owes much to Swift himself. And yet the information that she shares may bear notice. I'm not suggesting a Me Too moment with Swift, which would be, of course, an anachronistic gesture for a period when norms for appropriate behavior across the lines of class, age, and gender were vastly different. However, I am suggesting that to read Swift now, we need to change the kinds of questions we pursue. If, as James Woolley advised on Thursday night in his opening comments, we must ask how Swift's reading affected his writing, Shouldn't we also ask how or whether his actions affected his writing as well? To ask new questions about Swift's relationships with women in this latter part of his life might refashion our understanding of his complicated poems from this period and make legible information relevant for discussions of Swift in the 21st century.
had uh, two remarkable, very provocative uh, um, talks. Uh, one, Melinda Rapp, which asks us to think about uh, intergenerational trauma and multidirectional memory, uh, we'll figure around the idea of displacement, uh, the idea of the civil wars and the way in which they crop up in, um, uh, in um, Swift's um, passages, which are about genocidal violence of various kinds. And uh, Catherine Grassler's invitation for us to think again about uh, Pilkington's uh, evidence that when she offers us a lecture series this way, Swift's complex relationship to the women around him. So, all yours, uh, Helen, and then you. Oh, there oh, right. yes. yes, there yes. is a mic. Uh, it was here. really, really well. So I guess, um, Professor Rabb, I am agree with you in a way. I certainly don't care about the minutia of Swift's party affiliations, but I think, and I also don't care about what he actually did with Stella or Vanessa, but your paper made me think about why people cared so much for about 100 years. Both of your papers did, and people were pretty obsessed with Swift's love life, and I think because of these fascinating questions that you're raising about genre and about secret history, I think my question is, what is the relationship between this kind of genre of secret history, which I associate with the feminine, um, and I'm thinking about Swift's to read that scene in Gulliver where the female Yahoo assaults Gulliver as coming out of um, Manly and other secret histories is so brilliant and, and unexpected to me. Um, so I'm thinking about what is the relationship then between that moment in Gulliver and secret history as a feminine genre, in part, and the kind of public history of, which is occluded in your account, right, and, and obscured, of the civil wars um, that lead to these, these kind of horrible moments with the Winhams and these, this idea of mass extermination, which is also sort of kind of uncanny when you think about 20th century history, I always find. And Catherine, it seems to me really that you're kind of asking the same question in a different way because you're talking about violence again, but in the private feminine realm. And I was also thinking about Swift as a poet too, who really is kind of a feminine mm -hmm. poet, right? I mean, he's not writing heroic couplets and he's not writing epic. He's chatting away just like Pilkington, just like these women that he likes to chat with. So. His affinity with the feminine has always really interested me, um, but this how it connects to violence and trauma, I think you both are really raising fascinating questions about. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I think, <clears throat> thank you for the questions. Um, I'm gonna just start with the question about gender and genre. Yeah. Because I think that one of the uh, one of the benefits of the attention that has been paid to secret history so long neglected uh, over the past couple of decades has been a correction in terms of its association more with women writers than with men. Since most of the 1690s, secret histories were in fact male authored secret histories, uh, and and in, in specifically. Um, uh, and I think it's interesting the circuitous route that it took us to get there because the Tory secret histories by writers like Manley and uh, Haywood and Ben, um, you know, got attention first. And I think really because there was a sense, oh, here are women talking about sex, you know, just so openly signing their names, you know, talking about sex as political mm -hmm. and, 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 and seduction encounters as having to do with uh, politics and agency, and so on. Uh, but then looking further, it turns out that they weren't the first ones to, to do it, and that the uh, initial uh, spate of secret histories were mostly Whig male authored secret histories intended to denigrate monarchy by, uh, by exposing Charles II's mistresses, you know, the history of the Duchess of Portsmouth, they're all about, you know, about um, the, the peccadilloes of royals. And uh, as the Tories get 
sort of pick it up and start responding, uh, it becomes not so much focused on kings as on ministers, corrupt ministers and important people. No, 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 that's <laughs> If I could just pick up on uh, the interesting idea that you talk about in terms of Swift's affinity for the feminine. It's really interesting to think, I think, about Pope and Swift uh, in counterpose, because both in different ways are sort of resisting that idea at different phases in their, of the literary career, Pope in a very different way um, than Swift. But thinking of those last 15 years, the way he is confined within a domestic space, limited mobility, all the things that, that Pilkington also highlights in her memoirs serves to sort of underscore that, um, as you describe it, feminine affinity that we can see in his, his, his later verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important. Of Sharif and uh, Paula, and then we will really have to, sorry, but we come back to this. I'm sure Mylan will be inviting us to address some of these questions again later in the uh, day. So um, in a, a Gaman's book on Civil War, he talks about the, the noble household or the oikos, which Vince Bacora wrote a, a great book on, Households of the Soul. Um, and it occurs to me that uh, one way in which these secret histories um, talk about Civil War is through this kind of um, subversion of the noble household, as you, as you just mentioned. But, I, but there's a key term that keeps coming up in, in Swiss writing, which is the quarrel, or a quarrelsome people. Um, and I'm... And I'm thinking that there's a, a way in which he sort of miniaturizes civil war and makes it um, intimate and domestic, which is by referring to these differences as quarrels. So. Yes, thank you. No, I think that's, uh, that's, that's true. I think, um, again, as a kind of displacement of something that is occurring on an almost incomprehensibly large scale can be displaced onto something more manageable, like a domestic environment. So I, I, I think that's certainly a great example. Just to remind us that quarrel is not a, uh, what should I uh, way to put it, uh, a low level way of describing mm -hmm. um, the kind of tensions and passions that can rip apart a nation. Mm -hmm. uh, right, right. <coughs> um, I actually have a question. Okay. actually have questions for both of you, but I'll save the one um, for, uh, I'll ask the one of Catherine. Um, your, uh, one issue I've thought about a lot as someone who works with material text, textuality as well as text, is the issue of paratexts mm -hmm. and paratextual material. And I know as an editor of women's writing, you have had the challenge of deciding what to print, what not to print, what is the woman's writing, whatever. And there is a fantastic article, um, it's a little old now, but it was on race in the paratextual imagination or something in PMLA. And it was talking about when we reprint texts, do we print them with the paratextual material um, or not? Mm -hmm. And as someone who studies material text, I've always thought, well, it's very, very important with someone like Aquiano to print all the paratextual material. But you made me think that maybe there's another sub-distinction to be made between paratextual materials that are constitutive and not constitutive. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to be that you were suggesting that those paratextual materials are not constitutive of Barber's text, that she had a type of agency that allowed her to elide Swift's presence from the poems themselves, mm -hmm. whereas I would say with Equiano, he doesn't have that freedom because the abolitionists are making it possible to print the text at all. So I just wondered if you you know, wanted to play with that or, you know, it seems like she's doing something else and that we could take that as a sub-level of when we think about paratext. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think she's very, even though, again, she's cast as someone who is somewhat naive, she's very, very, very savvy in, in this, both the structuring of all of those preliminary, the paratextual materials. Um, and I don't think that we would read her accurately without those sort of false dedications, right? I mean, for, for even her, the one that she authors, which is almost another form of ventriloquizing, um, and the one that Swift um, uh, uh, heads to it. But I think that the preface, she really, 
is where she really begins, and it falls after, and the list of subscribers as well. Swift is in there, but she's earned, she's, she's been beating the bushes as much as he has, even though he is claiming so much credit for that. I mean, what you made me think of is if you were to, if you were to publish um, this edition, would you, what would you have, you know, would you include everything? And I would say, of course, it's essential to understand the really complicated relationship, that almost triangulation that the second dedication, her dedication um, raises, but that's a great question. I'm sorry to cut the, the questions off, but we really need to keep the show on the road. Thank you very much. Thank you.